All right. Good morning, class. I hope you're staying warm on a cold day. And as you know, school was canceled this morning for those that have been going to school. So I hope you're staying warm and taking advantage of this time to get your work done, staying on top of math and literacy, and then making sure you're staying and getting caught up with science, literature, and history. And that's what we're doing today. We're going to be jumping into our literature class and you're going to continue to read about King Arthur. So, who remembers what we read in chapters 1 through 6? What are some of the big moments that happened? That's right. We learn that Arthur went and took, as a young man, went and grabbed the sword out of the anvil, out of the stone, became King Arthur at a young age and that he ended up growing. We learned we covered a span where he grew up and we learned about Sir Lancelot and how he was such a great knight and that no one has ever defeated him. We also learned that um, Lady Genevieve, the one that married King Arthur started to actually fall for Sir Lancelot when Sir Lancelot went and picked up uh, Lady Genevieve to bring her to uh, King Arthur. And so that's kind of what we've learned uh, last time. And today we are going to jump into chapter 7 through 11. And to get you ready uh, for your study question quiz, I want you to read some questions that you might be asked on your quiz so that as we read you can look for the answers to these questions so I'll bring up eight questions that could be on your study question quiz and the first one is why does Tristram's stepmother try to poison him how is she saved after Tristram returns to Cornwall King Mark sends him back to Ireland and why is he sent back to Ireland in the legend, what evidence is there that Merlin is still inside the earth? Explain what the hermit tells Arthur about the night and siege perilous. How did the villagers get Lancelot to help the unhappy lady? And why is Lancelot suspicious of the lady's request to go with her to the forest? And then two more questions that might be on your study question quiz. What causes a stir of excitement at the feast in Camelot? And the last question that might be on your quiz for chapter 7 through 11. Do you think Gawain is wise to make his vow? Why or why not? So Gawain's going to make a vow. Do you think he's wise for making this uh, vow or, or do you not think he's wise? So that gets our mind ready for chapter 7 through 11. And like I said, or did last time, I think most of you guys enjoyed it. Uh, as we start to read, I will just remove my camera so we can just focus on the story. And that I won't be a distraction. Hopefully this helps you actually visualize and imagine, use your imagination to visualize what's actually going on. And that's the beautiful thing about books, all right? We can learn a lot of great lessons and learn about virtues, but then we can also use our own imagination to put ourselves in the stories. Movies are awesome. I, I love movies. But stories give us the ability to create the settings and the characters and, and put our own, you know, uniqueness on the story. And so we can do that as we continue to read King Arthur. So let's get ready. This is chapter seven, Sir Tristram. And I will remove. So you can just hear my voice. All right. Starting off, make sure, again, you're following along. You can either read with me, read aloud, um, or you can close your eyes and listen and try to imagine yourself being in this story. Sir Tristram was the second greatest knight in the world after Sir Lancelot. He was born in Leonese, which some men say once stretched between Cornwall and France and now lies under the sea. His mother was Elizabeth the sister of King Mark of Cornwall, and his father was uh, Melodius, King of Leonese, under King Arthur. Tristram's mother died when he was born, so he was called Tristram. 
which means a sorrowful birth. Melodius grieved for his wife seven years, but then married again. His new wife was jealous of Tristram because he would rule the land after his father instead of one of her own sons. She put poison in the silver jug in the children's room, but her own son drank it and died instead. A second time she did it, but when her husband was going to drink from the jug, she was forced to warn him, and so he discovered her plot to kill Tristram. She was sentenced to be burned, but when she was tied to the stake, young Tristram knelt before his father and begged for her life. So she was spared and loved the boy ever after, but Melodius thought it wiser to send him away for a while. He sent Tristram into France to learn languages and arts and deeds of arms. There Tristram learned the harp and became famous for his playing. He excelled everyone also in hunting and hawking. He combined with this with his music, inventing all the hunting and hawking calls on the horns and cries with the tongue that ever that have ever that been sorry. Uh, let's start again. He combined this with his music, inventing all the hunting and hawking calls on the horns and cries with the tongue that have been used ever since. He wrote the first book describing every animal and how to hunt it. The book of hunting and hawking was called the book of Sir Tristram. Finally, in deeds of arms, he excelled all whom he met, for he was a lover of brave deeds as well as of sweet music and noble words. When he was 19 years old, he went back to Leonese, and wherever he went, he was loved by rich and poor. So let's pause really quick. Some of you might know what hunting is, but do you guys know what hawking is? Well, look at the word for those that are still struggling. What is a hawk? Hawk is a type of bird. And so the book of hunting animals and hawking, meaning the, the hunt, the game with a trained hawk. So you're going out hunting, but then you have a trained hawk with you to help you while you're hunting. Here's a picture of Sir Tristram. He was the second greatest knight in the world after Sir Lancelot. And again, all these knights have mustaches. Maybe I'll grow my mustache out. Let me know what you think. All right, continue to read. At that time, King Anguish of Ireland sent a strong knight named Mar Maris to King Mark of Cornwall to contribute, sorry, to collect tribute that Cornwall had paid to Ireland for many years. Maris challenged any knight of Cornwall to fight him to free Cornwall from paying the tax. No one dared to come forward, least of all King Mark. Tristram heard of this shame and asked his father to let him go to the Cornish king to be knighted and take up the battle with Sir Maris. The more he was warned about the Irish knight's strength, the more determined he was, and at last he had his way. All right, so let's pause. Tribute. As a vocabulary word, a tribute is a payment made from one ruler to another as a sign of submission. And any of those, like I said, I like books and movies. I've seen the Hunger Games. They pay tribute by sending, you know, a boy and a girl from each district. All right, so continue to read. The fight was long and fierce. Sir Mars wounded Tristram badly in the first charge but the young man's strength carried him on. They fought for a half a day, and then the older knight began to give ground. Sir Tristram struck such a blow on Sir Maris' helmet that the sword went through it into his skull and stuck so that he could not pull it out. As he wrenched, a piece of the steel broke off and stayed in Sir Maris' skull. The Irish knight turned and ran, and Sir Tristram was the victor. He had freed Cornwall from tribute forever but he was very badly wounded. The spear point had been poisoned. For a month he lay near death. Then he was told that he would never get well until he went into the country from which the poison had come. So King Mark gave him a ship and all the equipment he needed, and he sat, sorry, and he set sail for Ireland. As he sailed up a river, he lay in bed and played his harp. As the boat sailed past the castle by the riverside, 
the king and queen within the castle heard the merriest music they had ever heard. They hastened to the waterside, found the wounded harper, and brought him into the castle. He concealed his name because he had lately defeated the king knight's Morris. Tristram now found out that not only had Morris died of his wound, but also that he was the queen's brother. So his life would have been short if the king had learned that he was, that it was he who had killed Morris. The king had a daughter named Isulet, who was famous for her beauty and her skill as a surgeon. Tristram was given into her charge to be healed of his wound. He repaired her by teaching her the harp, and they fell in love. At the court was a noble uh, Saracen from Syria called Sir Palamedes, who was also in love with Isulet, Isulet, and half willing to be baptized for her sake, in which case she would probably have had to marry him. So a Saracen, so at the court was a noble Saracen, an Islamic warrior from the Middle East. So there's this love battle, this love triangle between this uh, Saracen called Sir Palamedes and uh, Sir Tristram between um, Isolet, Isolt. So here's a picture of the king's daughter, Isolt. All right, continue to read. So a tournament was arranged while Tristram was still sick. And on the first day, Sir Palamedes defeated all who challenged him. On the second day, in spite of his wound, Tristram arose. In secret, Isolet dressed him all in white armor, and he left the castle by a secret doorway and suddenly appeared to challenge Sir Palamedes. He came onto the field as if he were a bright angel. He charged the Saracen knight and brought him out of the saddle to the ground. A roar went up from the crowd. Sir Palamedes tried to withdraw from the field, but Sir Tristram forced him to stand and fight and beat him to his knees. Sir Palamedes was made to promise to leave Isolt alone and to carry no weapons or armor for a year and a day. After this, Sir Tristram was treated well by the king and queen and lived in great happiness for some time, hawking and teaching the Irish the hunting craft he had invented. But one day, while he was in his bath, the queen saw his sword lying on his bed. A foot and a half from the point, a piece was broken out of the edge. The queen thought of the piece of steel that she had taken out of her brother's head before he died. She ran to her room and took the piece out of the box and fitted it to Sir Tristram's sword. It was the missing piece. In a fury, the queen seized the sword and ran on Tristram in his bath. His squire flung himself on her and saved his life. Tristram then had to confess to the king that he was indeed the slayer of Morris. Although the king and Isolet loved him, he had to leave Ireland. Before he went, the princess vowed to marry no one without his consent, and they exchanged rings. So here's a picture of what just happened. The queen charging after Tristram in his bath, but his servant jumped in the way to save him. So continue to read Tristram. He went back to Cornwall and became the foremost man at court in fighting, hunting, and playing the harp. Now King Mark, his uncle, was seized with the black jealousy that poisoned his entire life. Where Tristram was, the king would never win in jousting, hunting, or love. He could not rest until he got rid of him. Tristram had praised Isolde so highly that King Mark wanted to marry her. He thought that if he was sent Tristram back to Ireland, he would be killed by some of Mars's relatives. So King Mark sent him to ask King Anguish for the hand of Isolt and to bring her back to Cornwall to his court. The young man set out. His ship was driven by a storm back to the English coast near Camelot. There he learned that King Anguish had arrived to answer a charge of treason before King Arthur and could find no one to be his champion and fight for him. King Arthur's champion was Sir Blamore, Blamore a cousin of Sir Lancelot and a famous fighter. Tristram seized the chance to repay the Irish king for his hospitality in Ireland and offered to fight for him. He defeated Sir Blamore, who refused to yield and demanded to be killed, but Tristram would not kill him because he was of the family of Sir Lancelot, whom he admired more than any man in the world. For that, all the blood relatives of Sir Lancelot loved Sir Tristram forever. In great rejoicing, King Anguish and Sir Tristram sped to Ireland, where once again he found Isolt. 
when he asked her father for her hand, uh, when he asked her father for her hand for his uncle, the king said he wished it had been for himself, but he had given his word to King Mark and he would not break it. So Isolde made ready to sail with Sir Tristram to marry King Mark. Here's a picture of Tristram going back to Cornwall, playing the harp. All right. She took with her a noble lady named Bragwain. The queen secretly gave Bragwain a love po potion that Isola and Mark were to drink on their wedding day. It would make them love each other forever. On the journey, when Sir Tristram and Isola were down below in the cabin, they saw a gold flask containing what they thought was wine. It was the queen's magic drink. Laughing, they said, here is some special wine Bragwain has been keeping for herself. Let us taste it. Oh no, what's going to happen? So they drank it and thought that no drink they had ever tasted was so sweet and good. The magic potion worked in them and caused them to be in love with each other forever. They arrived in Cornwall and King Mark and Isola were married. Soon afterwards, Sir Tristram left Cornwall and went to Brittany. There he served Duke Hole and became the leading knight in the land. But he was restless and returned to Britain. He landed in bad weather and on an island of the coast of Wales. He met a knight, Sir Brandelise, uh, who took uh, Brand Isles, sorry, Sir Brand Isles, who told him that the round table desired his fellowship, for he was considered second only to Sir Lancelot. Sir Tristram served no one and held no vows of chivalry, and it was felt that he should, but something held him back. King Arthur was in Wales at the time and was trapped in an ambush. Sir Tristram rec rescued him, but when the king asked his name, he answered that he was a poor, adventurous knight and would not take the chance to join the king. But as time went by, the fame of the round table increased, and its deeds were on every man's lips. Not to serve the king became a sign of not being a true knight, while to be made a member of the round table became the ideal of knighthood. Sir Tristram finally decided to see if King Arthur would accept him. Here's a picture of the magic potion that they took. The biggest tournament of the year was held by King Arthur at the Castle of Maidens. Every knight of fame was there, wearing his colors and his arms. Sir Tristram came in disguise, carrying a plain black shield and refusing to give his name. On the first day of the tournament, he overthrew every knight who opposed him. At the end of the day, when the prizes were awarded, and he was victor, he rode away and hid in the forest. The next day he returned to the fighting. He found Sir Palamedes on King Arthur's side, so he joined the other side. On the third day all the spectators were shouting for the knight with the black shield, and Sir Tristram surpassed all his former victories. King Arthur and his Sir Palamedes attacked him together. He dealt his old Saracen enemy three tremendous blows on the helmet, shouting with each blow, Take that for Sir Tristram. Then he forced his horse right up to Sir Palamedes, seized him and with both hands by the neck, and dragged him from his horse onto his own saddle, and so rode with him a short way and flung him on the ground. The entire field roared with cheers. Then Sir Lancelot cried, Knight with the black shield, make ready to joust with me. And the highest test of all was on Sir Tristram. At the first charge, Sir Lancelot's spear gave him a wound that nearly killed him, but Tristram kept his seat and the saddle, and so the spear broke off. Seizing his sword with his remaining strength, he smote Sir Lancelot three great blows on the helmet and could do no more. Blindly he rode off the field into the forest. The king and Sir Lancelot sent out search parties for the knight with the black shield. He was nowhere to be found. Sir Lancelot and nine others swore a vow not to rest until they had found him and brought him before the king at Camelot. When Sir Tristram was well again, he set out in search of Sir Lancelot who would bring him to the king. He did not know that Sir Lancelot was also looking for him. He went to the tournament, sorry. He went to the tournament at the castle of the Hard Rock, hoping at last to meet him instead. Sorry, meet him. Instead, he found an attack being made on Sir Palamedes by nine knights, led by Sir uh, Ruse, Bruce, uh, Brusance, Paiti, I'm not for sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It was not a fair fight, and without hesitation, Sir Tristram went to the help of Saracen. No one could resist his blows, and the nine knights fled. Then Sir Tristram 
would have fought Sir Palamedes again, but he saw he was too exhausted from the battle with the nine. So they made an agreement to meet in the fortnight to fight their quarrel out. So what is a fortnight? Fortnight is two weeks. I know some of you guys play the game Fortnite, but this is spelled different, if you can tell. This is not N-I-T-E like the game, but Fortnite, meaning two weeks. So they set out to meet in two weeks. On the appointed day, Sir Tristram rode into the meadow. He met a knight riding all in white armor and white colors and took him to be Sir Palamedes. They advanced and fought. After a few strokes, Sir Tristram knew that a mightier man than Palamedes was here, and he was forced to put out his utmost. Even so, for hours he could make no headway, though neither did he give ground. Then Tristram asked the strange knight his name. Sir Knight, came the voice from within the steel helmet, my name is Sir Lancelot du Lac. Alas, said Sir Tristram, what have I done? For you are the man in the world that I love best. Sir Knight, said Sir Lancelot, tell me your name. My name is Tristram of Leonese. Or Lion, so it would probably be Lioness. Sorry, guys, probably Lioness. Let me double check that really quick. One moment, really quick. Some of these words are difficult. You guys could probably be saying some of these better than I could. One second, almost there. Yeah, Lioness. Sorry, guys. So this is Tristram of Lioness. Lee looks kind of like... I was pronouncing Leonese, so please forgive me. It is Lioness, and I'll, I'll make sure I double-check some of these words as we go through, okay, because so, I want you guys to pronounce them properly as well. So his name is Tristram of Lioness. Oh, heaven, said Sir Lancelot, what a strange thing has happened. So the great knights met in that last and told each other all the adventures that had led up to this meeting. This was the end of Sir Lancelot's quest and of Sir Tristram's wanderings. For Sir Lancelot took him to Camelot to King Arthur. The king came quickly, took him by the hand, and said, Sir Tristram, you are as welcome as any knight that ever came to this court. The queen and all the ladies flocked to see the famous knight, hunter, musician, and the lover of the queen of Cornwall. So Sir Tristram was established as a knight of the round table, and his name was written over the seat that had behold that belonged to Sir Morris. Remember, he killed Sir Morris. He was... He was there at the last meeting of the round table on the day on that day of Pentecost when Sir Galahad was seated in the perilous siege and that holy grail shone in the air before all their eyes. But when the knights scattered on their search for the holy grail, Sir Tristram was not among them. Perhaps the love potion had made him unable to leave Isolate. And maybe I should double check how to say her name really quick. Is 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 salt? Isolt, isolt, so isolt. No more is told of him, though a legend says that one day, while he was seated playing on his harp to Queen Isolt, King Mark crept up and killed him by a traitor's stroke in the back. Wow, that took a a big turn. So, one second, let's just reread that. So, Sir Tristram did not leave for the search of the Holy Grail because the love potion didn't want, he didn't want to leave Sir, uh, to leave the Queen, um, Isolt. And then we don't hear anymore. So, it says, no more is told of Sir Tristram. But as the story or the legend says, one day he was seated playing on his harp to the Queen, Queen Isolt, and King Mark the one who married Isolt came behind him and killed him by a traitor's stroke in the back. Wow. That was a lot. A lot about Sir Tristram. So if you need to take a pause, um, 
yeah, that was about 20 minutes. That was about a 20 minute for that chapter. So if you need to take a pause, uh, you can pause this video, come back to it, you know, walk around, grab some water or a snack, and then you can come back and continue to read. I'm going to keep going, right? So the end of Merlin. Merlin was the wizard. Uh, sorry, Merlin the wizard was a wise man nearly all his life. But when he was old, he fell into foolishness. Sorry, excuse me. Perhaps he trusted too much in his own power and so forgot that humility is the root of wisdom. He fell in love with one of the beautiful young ladies of the court called Vivian, a girl young enough to be his granddaughter. He became quite crazy about her, followed her about everywhere, and told her any magic secret she wanted to know. He knew he was making a fool of himself, and sometimes he would think he would use his power to destroy Vivian. One day she found him in this mood and made him swear a magician's oath that he could never break, that he would never use any enchantment against her. Vivian had been brought up by the Lady of the Lake, who was also a sorceress. One magician seldom likes another, and Vivian had grown up to have no love for Merlin, but because he was famous Sorry, because he was a famous figure at court, she was flattered and excited by his attention. She also hoped to get some magic power for herself. But after a while, Vivian became very tired of Merlin's devotions. Then she grew frightened of him and said he was a devil's son, but nothing discouraged Merlin. Indeed, he could not be hurt from attacks by other people. He knew this, but in his visions, he could also see that he was going to come to disaster. He warned King Arthur, whose faithful friend he had been throughout his reign, and shook his head when he foretold how the king would need him after he was gone. Since you know what is going to happen, do something about it, urged the king. Prevent the disaster by one of your spells. Merlin's pride in himself is what betrayed him into Vivian's hands. When the king urged him to use a spell, his eyes, his eye clouded and his voice dwindled away to muttering. He became very angry and vanished in the form of a cloud picture of Merlin. Vivian's moment finally came. She had been storing up magic words and spells of a simple kind that Merlin had taught her, words that had power over elementary things like rock or earth. One day she was roaming in the forest of Brosilandi with Merlin when he told her that there was a cave nearby with a small entrance that no one would find under a rock, sorry, under a shelf of rock. He offered to show her the marvelous treasures hidden in the cave, and she pretended to be very eager. Merlin led her through the wood, and on the way a cloud of foreboding came over his spirit. He was warned, but his confidence in himself was too complete. Sounds more a little bit like cockiness, not confidence, but we'll continue to read to see what happens. He went on and led Vivian to the entrance in, her, in the rock. The moment he had stepped inside the mouth, of the cave, she pronounced the magic word that had power over rock, and the two sides of the opening sealed together behind Merlin. So here's a picture of Vivian. Only the person who said the word could say the other word that would undo it. All Merlin's magic was useless to him and his imprisonment underground. Vivian ran from the rock in panic, and as she ran, the thickets closed behind her and the way back was lost forever. Merlin is sealed up in the earth by his own folly and pride, and the shakings of the earthquakes and the blasts of fire and water that burst to this day from the earth, the master of magicians groans and tries to soothe his unhappy heart. So let's just recap what we just read right there. So we learn that Merlin, as he grew older, um, became too confident, or I would say too cocky, meaning that he wasn't being humble. He was overly confident in himself, and he kind of lost um, sight of, of humility in chase of Vivian. He wanted to win her so bad that he was willing to do all these things that he knew wasn't going to be healthy for him or, or good for him in the long run, but he wanted to win his heart, and so he became prideful. And this pride led to his destruction. He taught all these spells to Vivian um, and because he wanted to impress her, but that actually became his downfall. And Vivian sealed him in the rock. 
or underground and uh, uh, as the legend says, all the earthquakes and blasts of fire and water to this day is because of Merlin being trapped underground and he can't do anything about it. All right, part three, the quest of the grail. So the birth of Galahad. A hermit, remember what a hermit is? We read this in chapters one through six. A hermit is someone who lives alone. So a hermit came into the great hall at Camelot. One day when King Arthur was holding high court for the feast, the king loved to talk with wise men. So while the meal was served, the hermit stood by him and uttered prophecies. He pointed to the siege perilous and asked if the king knew who would sit there. So a prophecy is mystical predictions of the future. We also learned about the pancake prophecy and dynasties of China in our first quarter. So making a prediction of the future. No, said the king, looking around at his knights who all shook their heads. We know not. I know, replied the hermit. He that shall sit there is not yet born, but this year he will be born. He will sit in the siege uh, perilous and win the holy grail. Folding his arms, the hermit then stalked out with a slow and stately tread. It was a disappointment to everyone that the adventure of the siege uh, Perilous was not going to happen for so long, since the person who would sit in it was not even born. Sir Lancelot, who was used to being called the best knight in the world, was secretly relieved that the siege was not for him. He did not know how closely his fate was linked with it. After the feast, he rode out as usual on a quest to keep order in the countryside. His quest took him to Carbonek, where he had not been for a long time. Scarcely had he ridden under the gate of the town when the people came crowding around his horse and led him into the main square in front of the tower, shouting, Welcome, Sir Lancelot, first among knights, for you shall help us out of danger. What do you mean? exclaimed Sir Lancelot. One man stood forward with his hand on the great charger's neck and said, Ah, fair knight, within this tower there is an unhappy lady who has been there in pain many winters, for she is always sitting and scalding water. We know that you can rescue her. Scalding, meaning like burning hot or boiling. Well, said he, tell me what I must do. So they took him into the tower, up the stone stairs to an iron door that they unbolted and made him go inside into a room full of scalding steam. There he found a young woman sitting naked in a tub of boiling water. He took her by the hand and out she stepped. She told him that Queen Morgan Le Fay had put her in boiling water by a spell because she was called the most beautiful woman in the land. No one could undo this spell except the best knight in the world, and she had been there for five years. She was Elaine, daughter of Pels, ruler of Carbonek, and keeper of the Hallows. When she had dressed, Elaine went with her ladies and Sir Lancelot to the chapel to give thanks to God. She had already fallen in love with Sir Lancelot, and she remained in love with him all her life. She knew that she had not the least chance of marrying him because he loved no one but the queen. And although she had suffered so much under an enchantment in the last five years, she was not above trying enchantment on Sir Lancelot to get him to marry her. On coming out of the chapel, Sir Lancelot was met by another group of townspeople who said, Sir Knight, since you have delivered this lady, deliver us from the, a serpent that is here in a tomb. Sirs, he answered, smiling. Show me the tomb, and I will do what I can. On the tomb was an inscription that said, Here shall come a leopard of king's blood, and he will slay the serpent. And this leopard will father a lion, who will surpass all other knights. Sir Lancelot read this and said nothing. He was a king's son, son of a king of Benwick, and his shield was painted with leopards. Sword in hand, he raised the lid of the tomb. Out reared a dragon, spitting fire out of his mouth. Everyone screamed. Sir Lancelot struck at it, but its scaly skin deflected the blade, and its fire drove him back. Holding his shield before him to keep off the fiery breath, he sprang in and cut and sprang out of reach again, and so on for a long time. Elaine watched every stroke, noting the immense strength, the concentration of eye and hand and foot, and the fury with which he flung himself into battle. No other fighter can compare with Sir Lancelot in action. Elaine decided on her enchantment. After a long struggle, Sir Lancelot killed the dragon. It occurred to him that the inscription on the tomb 
was definitely about him, though he did not understand it. Pels gave a feast to celebrate two such deeds of rescue in one day. The doors of the hall were thrown open, and the people of the little town crowded in to stare at the famous knight, a visitor from the great world and the foremost knight in Christendom, dressed in scarlet with white ermine. All right, let's go forward. Ermine. Let's make sure we're pronouncing this right. Ermine. So ermine, sorry, ermine meaning a weasel whose fur turns white in winter used to trim clothing. So dressed in scarlet with white ermine and gold upon it, or fur, the mighty figure of Sir Lancelot dominated the table, yet he was a courageous, or sorry, he was courteous to the least as to the highest, his eyes and face as attentive to the youngest as to Pales or the lady Elaine. He did not show off or boast, but treated everyone as his brother and equal. During that dinner, there was not a man who would not have died for him, nor a woman who was not in love with him. Sir Lancelot is a gentleman, right? He has that coat of chivalry that we learned about in, uh, so far in this book. So this was Carbonek, the place of the hallows. In such power of love there, the Holy Grail was almost certain to appear. So it did. A dove flew in at a window singing a golden censer. Censer is a container for burning incense. So a dove flew in at a window singing a golden uh, censer in her beak. Swinging, sorry, swinging a golden censer. So a golden container it was in her beak. And the hall was filled with the most delicious smell in the world. And on the tables appeared every meat and drink that each person liked best. This was followed by the appearance of a young girl bearing in her hands a golden vessel. Immediately, Pels, the keeper of the hallows, knelt down, and so did everyone in the hall. After a time, the girl and the holy vessel vanished. Everyone got up. What does all this mean? asked Sir Lancelot. Sir, said the king, you have seen the holy grail here. Meanwhile, Elaine had been busy. Her lady-in-waiting, um, Bryson, was an enchantress, and she agreed to help Elaine's plan. She put a spell on Sir Lancelot and gave him a magic cup of wine after dinner that made him do anything she wanted. That night, Sir Lancelot married Elaine, not knowing what he did. They went to bed in a room where every window had been blocked to keep out any ray of light. The enchantment only worked in the dark. In the morning, Sir Lancelot awoke, and not liking to sleep in a room without a breath of air, got open and opened the window. Sorry, got up and opened the window. As he did so, the spell was broken. He turned from the window, and to his amazement saw a woman, Elaine, in the room with him. When, he, when she told him what she had done, and he thought of the queen, despair and shame wept, swept over him. He believed that his strength and arms came from his being true to his vows of service to the king and loyalty to the queen. Now he saw that he had broken his vow and lost both his love and the secret of his strength. Alas, that I had lived so long, he said. He seized his sword and would have killed her, but his goodness stopped him. Elaine swore to him that she had done it because she loved him and would love him until she died. Even in his broken-hearted misery, Lancelot respected that. In sick silence, he dressed and armed and rode away as fast as he could. He went back to the court and was hardly able to meet the eyes of the queen. No word of this adventure had reached the court. Unfortunately, there was bustle everywhere because the king was preparing to go to war. Sir Lancelot took up his work and avoided the company of the ladies, spending his days training knights or inspecting equipment. But the preparations took a long time, and one day a rumor reached out, sorry, reached court that Elaine, the daughter of Pels of Carbonek, had had a son whom she said was Lancelot's and she had given him Sir Lancelot's first name, Galahad. Queen Genevieve heard the rumor. She thought of Lancelot's vows. She remembered how unlike himself he had been when he had came back to court, and how little she had seen of him all winter. Black rage came over her. She sent for him, and by the look of the messenger's face, Sir Lancelot knew that trouble was coming. The queen was waiting for him in her private room, standing rigid and icy. She called Sir Lancelot a traitor and a false knight and brought up all the things that had been eating out his 
heart these past months and that he hoped to hide it from her, hide from her. To be the father of this child, Galahad had cost Sir Lancelot his honor, his respect, and now the love of his queen. Galahad was to be the best knight in the world, but in bringing him into existence, Sir Lancelot lost all that he had loved and honor. Here's a picture of what took place. He explained about the enchantment as well as he could. It sounded very lame, but Genevieve realized that something strange must have happened and that Sir Lancelot was very much distressed. After a long and bitter conversation, the queen excused Sir Lancelot, but that was all that could be said. Both remained equally unhappy. At last, the king's expedition was ready, and the fleet set sail, carrying Sir Lancelot away to the wars. Time passed. The month ran... The months ran into years, and at last the army came home. The queen had forgiven Sir Lancelot and welcomed him back with King Arthur, as in the days before Elaine. But he was not to escape his fate. A feast was given to celebrate the return of the knights, and Pell sent Elaine as the wife of Sir Lancelot, with a hundred attendants on horseback. The king and queen received her, as did Sir Gawain, the king's nephew, and Sir Tristram and all the knights of the round table, except Sir Lancelot. He saw her arrival from a turret. A turret is a small tower. So he saw her arrival from a small tower, or a turret, and watched unseen. He saw the lady-in-waiting, Brizen, or Brizen, who had given him the enchanted cup of wine, leading the child of Galahad by the hand. He saw the royal reception that Elaine was given, and he saw the king and queen speak to Galahad. That night... Sir Lancelot was absent from dinner, and all the time Elaine remained at court, he would not speak to her. <clears throat> Naturally, this created a scandal at court. Soon it was whispered to the queen that Sir Lancelot was only pretending to shun Elaine in order to keep in with the king and queen, but in secret was meeting her and telling her quite a different story. In a weak moment, Genevieve believed it. She sent for him and said, You false traitor knight, leave the court and never dare to come into my sight again. At these words, Sir Lancelot fell senseless to the ground. When he recovered, his heart broke and his mind gave way. He flung himself out of the bay window in the queen's room and ran into the wild woods, a madman, and was not healed for, for two years. Whew, that was a lot too. Poor Sir Lancelot doing such good deeds and then getting tricked into um, fathering a child. It's not... Know, definitely not fair you know for him that's what i think what do you guys think let me know in the comments below or or on canvas okay let's uh double check i think we have two more chapters so again if you need to take a break one two okay so we read chapter seven eight nine this is ten eleven so two more chapters for today okay if you need to take a break, you can pause this video and come back to it later, okay? <clears throat> the coming of Galahad to court. It was 20 years since the founding of the round table. All that time, the siege perilous stood empty. Sir Lancelot sat on one side of it and different knights at different times on the other. Now, unknown to anyone, the day and the night for whom it was made had come. On the vigil of Pentecost, the entire court and the knights of the round table were gathered at the great feast. As they assembled in the hall for dinner, a lady came riding fast on a leathered, lathered horse. So meaning sweating. So a lady came riding on a sweating horse. She hurried into the hall and went straight to the king and asked for Sir Lancelot. She said she came from Pels, Lord of Carbonek, and must ask him to come with her into a forest. Sir Lancelot's dark eyes rested long on the lady's face. He remembered Elaine and the enchanted cup of wine. Was it another trick? What do you want for me to come for? He asked. You will know when you get there, she answered. It was not the kind of answer that a deceiving person would make up. Well, he said slowly, I will come with you. While he was getting ready, people ran to the queen that he was going to see Elaine again. But the queen was wiser now than in the days when wagging tongues could make her believe ill or Sir Lancelot. The love between them now was sure and safe from mischief. He came to take leave of her 
and promised to be back by dinner time the next day. Then he rode away with his squire and the lady. They rode fast through a forest and came to an abbey. All right, so let's go forward really quick. An abbey is a monastery where monks or nuns live. And we're learning about that in history. Monasteries. We just read about that. So they went through a forest and came to an abbey. A great company of nun, nuns came to greet them and made Sir Lancelot welcome. He realized that some strange event must have been, must be about to happen. As soon as he was unarmed, twelve nuns came in, and with them yet was a young lad of about fifteen, the most beautiful lad that Sir Lancelot had ever seen. In his eyes was a look of natural truth and affection, and he carried himself easily and simply. The nuns brought the youth to Sir Lancelot and said that he was Galahad. His father stood amazed, but with great, with a deep joy. He exchanged greetings with his son while all the nuns wept. Sir, they said, we bring you this child whom we have cherished, and we pray you to make him a knight, for there is no more worthy man in the world from whom he could receive the order of knighthood. Does he wish this himself? asked Sir Lancelot. Galahad answered, Yes. Then he shall receive the order of knighthood on the high feast. So when midnight was past, the entire sisterhood gathered in the chapel, and at the first hour of Whit Sunday, by the light of a hundred candles, Sir Lancelot gave his son the order of knighthood. He had been tricked into marrying Elaine, and so brought and so broke his knightly vow to be true to the queen. Now he knew that he had moved on into a deeper state, where good came out of evil. As Galahad knelt at the altar, step before him. Um, altar stepped before him. Sir Lancelot felt nothing but love for him and for his birth and for the agonies of madness and loss that he himself had suffered because of it. It was the first of those states of love that Galahad was to bring about in the world. That morning, Sir Lancelot kept his promise to the queen and returned to Camelot for the feast. As the knights took their seats at the round table, there was a stir of excitement for new golden letters shone around the siege perilous. They read, The siege is to be fulfilled. A staggering thought struck Sir Lancelot. Could it be that his son Galahad was the mysterious figure for whom the siege perilous had been waiting all these years? He would wait and see. I suggest, he said to the others, that this writing should be covered up until the man comes who will fulfill all this. So they threw a silk cloth over the sea and hid the writing. Then the king gave word for dinner. But just as he was going to seat himself, a squire came running in, knelt before him and said, Sire, down there by the river, there is a great stone floating on the water, and I saw a sword sticking up out of it. A stone and a sword? King Arthur remembered the sword and the stone that twenty years ago had given him this throne. I will see this marvel, he said, and went down to the castle walks to the river bank. Everyone in the hall followed in a long procession. Procession meaning like they're all falling behind him, like in a group. On the water flooded, floated a block of red marble, and out of it rose a fine sword, and its jeweled hilt was carved. Only he by whose side I ought to hang shall take me, and he shall be the best knight of all the world. The king turned to his friend Sir Lancelot, clapped him on the shoulder, and said that surely the sword was his. Sir Lancelot smiled, but answered gently, Sire, it is not my sword. I am not going to put my hand to it, for I know it is not for me. I am sure that some great thing will begin today. The king looked around, doubtful whom to call on to attempt the sword. Perhaps Gawain, his nephew, who was always trying to rival Sir Lancelot, would have a chance now. Nephew, said the king, will you try? Sir Gawain looked at Sir Lancelot and at the sword and at all the watching faces. He was afraid to fail. Sire, he replied, excuse me, I would rather not. King Arthur knew he wanted to be urged. Sir, for my sake... And at my command, try to take the sword. Sire, at your command, I will obey, answered Gawain. He stepped onto the bank, a splendid figure in purple and gold, his red hair shining, his face white with excitement. He grasped the sword, but it held fast. Stiff with humiliation, Sir Gawain stepped back. The king knew that someone else must fail too. To save his nephew's pride, he called on Sir Percival, who set little store on pride. He tried and failed and stepped back smiley, smiling. Then the king decided to leave the sword for the moment and to go back to the feast. They all took their places once more in the hall, 
and dinner proceeded. Suddenly, with a clap like thunder, all the windows and doors closed. Yet the light did not dim out at all. There was dead silence, and every heart was afraid. The voice of the king spoke cheerily. Fair fellows and lords, we have seen marvels today, but before night we shall see greater ones. As he spoke, in came an old man dressed in white, unknown to anyone in the hall. He led with him a young knight in red armor, with only an empty scabbard by his side. Sir Lancelot's heart moved. He had seen the young knight at midnight. No one else knew him or had ever seen him before. The old man led him to the king and said, Sire, I bring you here a young knight by whom the marvels of this court shall be accomplished. Here's a picture of that going on, the old man bringing the young knight. Sir, said the king, standing up, you are right. Welcome, and the young knight with you. The old man helped the knight to take off his armor. Under it, he wore a tunic of scarlet linen, and the old man hung on his shoulders a cloak edged with white fur. Then he said to the young man, Sir, follow me. He led him to the round table, to the siege perilous. Everyone saw Sir Lancelot in the next seat exchange a greeting with the stranger. The old man lifted up the silk cloth, and the writing of the chair had changed to, This is the siege of Sir Galahad. Sir, said the old man, that place is yours. And dead silence, the young knight sat down. Sir Lancelot drew a sharp breath. Nothing happened. The lad sat easily, looking around him quite naturally at the faces of famous knights. Then he turned and said goodbye to the old man who left the hall. Everyone, everyone began to talk again, and the dinner went on. But now the news was buzzing around that the name of the new knight was Galahad, and so he must be Sir Lancelot's son. The old, stir, the old story of Sir Lancelot and the tricked marriage with Elaine was told again. People slipped out of the hall and ran to the queen's apartments with the news, swearing the newcomer was exactly like Sir Lancelot. The queen answered, I should like to see him. He must be a nobleman for so is his father. After dinner, the king took Sir Galahad down to the river to see the sword and the marble rock. The queen saw the company going out, and she gathered her ladies and went too. The king told Sir Galahad what an extraordinary object it was and how several famous knights had failed to draw the sword. Sir Galahad looked surprised. Sire, it is not extraordinary, he answered politely, because the adventure is not theirs, but mine. I knew this sword would be here, so I did not bring one but here is the scabbard. It was indeed the scabbard that Merlin had left on the island that could be reached only by a bridge six inches wide. No one knew how Galahad had won it, and he said no more about it. Galahad took hold of the hilt and drew the sword out of... Sorry. Galahad took hold of the hilt and drew the sword out as easily as the young lad Arthur had done 20 years ago in London, in a London churchyard. He slid it into the scabbard and smiling, it is better there than in the stone. Then he took it out again and looked at it up and down admire, admiringly, admire, admire, wow, admiring, admiringly, wow, that is tough for me to say, sorry guys. It is the sword of Sir Balin, the savage, the great fighter, he said proudly. With it, he killed his brother, Sir Balin, by mistake. He went on to tell the king the story, and the king smiled at Sir Lancelot, for they had known of the events Sir Galahad spoke of before he was ever born, but the adventures of the day were not yet over. So that story of Sir Balin and Balin, I'm pretty sure was in the introduction and the prologue. So if you haven't read that, make sure you either listen to it here on my channel, on one of the videos, or um, read it yourself. Okay. Our last chapter, guys, I know this has been a long video. Um, I hope that if you've kind of lost focus that you've paused and then come back. And, but I hope you're enjoying it. You know, this is a, a fun adventure. Uh, definitely shows us the, the blessings and the curses of, you know, keeping your virtues or, or, or not keeping them, right? We learned about the downfall of Merlin because he was becoming prideful. But we have learned that, you know, being true and honest and um, being humble and doing good to others like Sir Lancelot. And even though he was tricked, you know, people still forgave him because of the great man that he is. So it's been an awesome story. I hope you've been enjoying it. So this is our, our last chapter for uh, this week, chapter 11, uh, titled How the Quest Began. 
Uh, so let's read this. <clears throat> As the shadows began to creep from the oaks across the meadow on the long June evening, the entire company followed the king to supper, every night sitting in his place. Suddenly there was a terrific peal of thunder, a beam of light seven times more bright than sunlight slid into the hall and filled the entire place with brilliance. Nobody could speak, and they all sat stone still. Down the beam of light glided the Holy Grail, a cup covered in white silk so that no one could see it, nor could they see if anyone carried it. Once again, the bounties of the Grail were displayed, the beautiful smell, the food and drink that delighted each man most. Down the hall went the holy vessel, and then it vanished. After a while, the power of speech returned, and the king gave thanks to God for showing them all the grail on this feast of Pentecost. But thanks were not enough for Sir Gawain. He struck the table and stood up. We have had whatever we desired to eat and drink, he declared stormily. But one thing we were denied. We did not see the holy grail because it was completely covered. So I here make a vow that tomorrow without delay I shall set out on a quest of the holy grail and that I shall keep it, keep it, up a year and a day if need be, and I will never return to court until I have seen it more openly than it was shown here. There were shouts of agreement, and one by one the knights rose and took the same oath. Sir Lancelot knew that the motive was wrong, because it had been God's decision not to show the holy object openly to their eyes, but he also knew that the entire day had been leading up to this, and the roots of it all lay far, far back and were not for him to distangle or distangle disentangle or deny so he took the vow <clears throat> as the knights sorry for that <clears throat> as night after night pledged himself king arthur foresaw the breakup of the round table the scattering of its members and the ruin of its work in the kingdom he foresaw all the force on the side of law leaving britain on his quest and evil rearing itself again he would be old and have no band of young men to fight for right. Tears were in his eyes as he faced his nephew. Alas, you have killed me by this vow, he said, for you have broken the most glorious and truest order of knighthood that was ever seen in any kingdom of the world. When they leave here, I know that they will never meet again, for many will die on this quest. I regret it very deeply, for I have loved them as my life. The scattering of this fellowship breaks my heart, for it is a long time now that we have been together. Ah, sire, said Sir Lancelot, comfort yourself. It will be a great honor to us, much more than if we died in any other way. We are bound to die sometime. Lancelot, the king returned and looked at him. The very love I have had for you all my life makes me so sad, for there was never a king who had so many worthy men as I have today at the round table, and that is the cause of my grief. The king could not be comforted, and the queen and all the court felt the same foreboding. Every woman wept, and every man felt that a time of greatness was coming to an end. The entire town was stirred by preparations for so many farewells. The queen sent for Galahad and had a few words with him, in case she never saw him again. At last the time came for bed. Though no one could rest, the king ordered Sir Galahad to sleep in the royal bed that night and be lodged like a king. After a, redless, <clears throat> after a restless night, King Arthur went early to Sir Lancelot's room, Sir Lancelot's rooms, and asked him if there were any possible means of stopping the quest. But one of the knight's chief oaths was to be true to his promise. Lancelot pointed this out. They both stood silent and knew that the thing must run its course. Sir Lancelot put his hand on the king's shoulder, and so they stood a moment. These two close friends of twenty years or more who had at all times been each other's first and chief support. Then they went together to join the queen at an early celebration of mass to mark the opening of the quest. After the service, 150 knights, all the knights of the round table, took leave of the king and queen. A long procession of knights uh, wound, wound through the streets to the gate, followed by cheering and weeping townspeople. The king rode with his knights for the last time, with Sir Lancelot beside him. Neither spoke, for the king's heart was too heavy for speech. At the gate, the king drew on the reins of his horse, outrode his fellowship of knights, the most glorious band of men in any kingdom, famous for courage and honor. Each one saluted the king, who had created the knighthood that had made them more than any other man or any other men. 
Then, one by one, they spurred their horses and rode away. Okay, so they are on their quest now. And that is going to be it for today. Whew, that was a lot of reading, and I, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. That was, that was, like I said, that was a lot of reading, but that was really cool. A lot of awesome action and you know, good stories. And like I said before, a lot of you know, good moments of learning about virtues. So um, I'm going to end it there, and I hope that you guys do great. Do, uh, do a great job on your study question quiz. I know that you will. Um, if you need to, go back to the beginning of this video and uh, re-listen to those questions to get you prepared to answer uh, the questions on the study quiz. So that's going to be it. I'm going to end it here. You guys are awesome, and I will see you guys in the next video.